Hi, it's Kai. Number eight, Tarasha. Maybe you live in a part of the world where TV ad slots are packed with services offering an affordable funeral plan. Morbid though it is, death is a big business in Western society. Go somewhere like Indonesia, however, and you discover a whole different attitude to the deceased. In the South Sulawesi region are the Taraja people. They are known for their elaborate traditions when a loved one passes away. For starters, there's no keeping the body on ice in the morgue in preparation for the big day. For them, death is not something to dread and avoid, but a central part of living that involves honoring the deceased with the utmost care to aid their passage into the afterlife. The corpse is brought home, and I don't mean put in a coffin for people to look at before a funeral. I mean the body is taken home and it stays there for a considerable amount of time. A great send-off is planned, but it takes the Daraja a little longer to organize than some. So what happens to the deceased family member during this period? They are given food and drink and their clothes are changed daily. The family simply swats the flies away from their deceased loved one's rotting body. This incredible tradition shows the importance ancient cultures place on death as well as a respect for someone's life that goes above and beyond. Caring about your relatives into old age is one thing. Cooking a meal for them and changing their socks when they're long gone takes devotion. What may look bizarre and scary to us is a long-held tradition to others. Number seven, Chimbu Skeleton Dancers. This looks like the best Halloween party of all time, right? Wrong, it's actually a traditional tribal ritual. The Chimbu people can be found in the rugged mountain valleys in Papua New Guinea. Occupying the area of the central highlands, their alternate name is Simbu. This reportedly means a pleasant surprise in the local Kuman tongue. Though it wouldn't be a pleasant surprise if you saw a group of painted skeleton dancers coming towards you in any remote setting. It can be an entertaining display for tourists, but was actually designed to scare off rival tribes. The tribe faces their own fear of ghosts while terrifying their superstitious foes. What better way to conquer your fears than by facing and embodying them? This tradition was developed with the idea that their enemies would not perceive them as human and would believe the dancers have supernatural powers. I can't argue with that approach because if I was walking through the jungle and ran into one of these guys, I'd probably be scared too. The Chimbu tribe first made contact with the Western world in 1934, when they are first spotted by explorers from Australia. There isn't a lot of information about them, really, outside of the tribe members interacting with modern society, of course. The rest of their culture and customs, for the most part, remain a mystery. Number 6. North Centennial Island Attack The Sentinelese are arguably the most famous remote tribe. Despite being well-known, they are also a complete mystery. It's precisely because we can't get near them that they are in fact in the headlines. North Centennial Island is part of the Adaman and Nicoabar Islands archipelago, located in India's Bay of Bengal. It's home to an indigenous tribe called the Sentinelese. Experts don't know a lot about this tribe due to their long established history of violently rejecting all contact with the outside world. For thousands of years, the tribe has lived in near complete isolation, speaking a language nobody else knows. The Sentinelese have attacked or killed nearly everyone who has tried approaching the island. Because of this hostility, authorities have even decided against trying to retrieve the bodies of slain outsiders to avoid further violence. Nobody knows why the tribe is so quick to attack, although a good guess is that they simply want to be left alone. But their self-imposed seclusion benefits them because they have no natural immunity or resistance to a handful of modern diseases and sicknesses. In 1956, the Indian government implemented legislation banning visitors from going within five miles of the island for their safety and ours. Only a select handful of professionals have been allowed there since, including an Indian anthropologist, Triklanath Pandit, whose team established the first and only peaceful interaction with the tribe in 1991. Some people have ignored the ban against visiting with deadly consequences. 
The most recent case happened in 2018, when a 26-year-old American Christian missionary named John Chow paid fishermen to illegally ferry him to the island. Chow knew the dangers associated with going near the tribe, but he was intent on spreading Christianity to the tribe, even though he didn't know their language and they certainly did not speak English. He tried multiple times to get to shore on a kayak, but he was met with arrows every time. For most people, that would be a fair enough warning to back off, but not for Chow. Eventually, the men who had taken him most of the way to the island saw the tribe dragging his lifeless body into the trees. The fishermen who helped Chow reach the off-limits island were arrested and charged for their crimes, but the Indian government does not prosecute the Sentinelese for killing invaders. Considering all that is known about the tribe, the answer to avoid a violent encounter is simple. Follow the law and stay away. This tragedy was entirely avoidable by the sounds of things and exists as a stark warning to those who want to contact these tribes. You tend to find out why they're non-contactable if you do. A BBC report from the Times states that the number of Sentinelese are low, with 150 mentioned as a top estimate. They're a tight-knit group and will defend themselves, so best to keep your distance. What do you think about the Sentinelese people? Should the rest of the world leave them alone? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number five, the Fleischeros. In the Javari region of the Brazilian Amazon, near the Peruvian border, an uncontacted tribe known as the Fleshiros, whose name means arrow shooters, lives secluded in the jungle. Not a whole lot is known about them. Even their language and exact ethnicity are mysteries. What we do know is that the tribe is extremely skilled with bows and poison arrows, hence their nickname, and some have learned the hard way that they don't hesitate to shoot at intruders. Journalist Scott Wallace is one of the very few people who've ever come face to face with the tribe. In 2002, he ventured into their territory with the noble goals of protecting the tribe and their resource-filled land. His mission involved checking up on the group's health, which had to be done from a distance as not to transmit any dangerous germs that the tribe will have no natural resistance or immunity to, or possibly end up dead themselves. Sadly, the Brazilian government has scaled back on its funding for protecting its uncontacted tribes over recent years, leaving groups like this increasingly vulnerable to the outside world. In 2017, a group of gold miners who had just finished an illegal job in the Amazon were at a bar bragging about how they murdered 10 Fleischeros members they encountered in the rainforest. As if bragging about murder wasn't enough, the killers had tools and other personal effects that they had taken from the slain bodies as trophies to prove their story was true. The horrific ordeal drew widespread criticism against the Brazilian government for slashing its budget on protecting the vulnerable indigenous groups. Many suspect that these needless killings happen more often than anyone realizes, since they tend to occur in extremely remote regions, far from the scrutiny of mainstream society or law enforcement. Number four, Wadabi. Way before the invention of speed dating and Tinder, civilizations have enjoyed numerous and in some cases elaborate means of courtship. One of the most extensive and traditional paths to companionship is followed by the Wadabi, who live within the Sahel region of Africa. Marrying in the Wadabi culture sounds rather eventful, to say the least. In this tribe, it's a totally normal thing for a woman to tie the knot with two husbands. Sounds a little stressful to me. However, it's the findings of those perfect mates that raise eyebrows, at least by Western standards. The men of the tribe take part in a multi-day wife-stealing festival called Yaki. Yaki who? At the ceremony, men adorn themselves with special jewelry and makeup, including a black natural paint that is applied onto the lips to make their teeth white and more noticeable. They also dance on the tips of their toes to appear taller and show off their widened eyes and teeth. Men participate in tests of dance and beauty in a bid to impress the women, most of whom are already married. The location of each festival, which reportedly happens every 52 weeks, is a closely guarded secret. A man who is able to roll his eyes and grin simultaneously is considered attractive. 
Other physical features, such as a long jaw, thin lips, and white eyes make a man irresistible amongst the Wadobi women. Number three, Sepik. Tribal traditions can involve some rather extreme initiation rituals. American frat houses have nothing on some of the things endured by young people in far-flung places such as Papua New Guinea. To the north lies the Sepik River, by which house, tambaran, or spirit houses are built. It's here that members of the Sepik tribe go to learn life lessons from their elders. You don't acquire knowledge without a little pain. To turn a boy into a man, small cuts are made on the back, shoulder, and upper torso many of them. The idea is that the cuts will form into welts, and by the end of it, well, does this remind you of anything? The young man has a decidedly scaly, if brutal, look. This crocodile effect is intentional. As described in a BBC report in 2018, the creature represents power. There are even beliefs that the sepik began life as crocodiles. By piercing the skin, the blood flows, releasing the old, and welcoming the new croc-shaped existence. The pain is so severe that boys have been known to pass out during it. And honestly, who can blame them? Thankfully, flute players are on hand to provide what I'm guessing is a kind of musical anesthetic. Also, a combination of oil and mud is applied to the fresh cuts to protect the wounds. Bamboo points were the preferred method of scarifying, though razors seem to be used today. Not sure which one would be worse. Along with the cutting, the young men may spend several months inside the spirit house learning life skills from the initiated men. They gain knowledge of the village spirits, how to fish, how to carve, and how to support their wife and family. Number two, Nanette. Chances are you associate reindeer with good old Father Christmas, AKA Santa Claus. There's one group who makes reindeers their focus in life. They're called the Nanette. They live on the remote Russian Yamal Peninsula. In freezing Arctic conditions, they exist side by side with the antlered ones. It's a harmonious relationship by the sounds of things, though the reindeer also provides them with food, warmth, and transportation. Lassos are carved from reindeer tendons, tools, and sled parts from bone. Poor old Rudolph is useful in all kinds of ways. The Nanette mainly seem to herd the reindeer, going on awe-inspiring journeys that take them across thousands of miles so the animals can enjoy the seasons. Doesn't sound so bad, does it? Unfortunately, the outside world has a habit of making this simple life a tad complex. Authorities have attempted to crack down on the Nanette in the past with ethnic cleansing policies threatening their way of life. Environmental factors such as climate change and the much prized oil reserves under the ice on the peninsula also spells big trouble for the tribe. How much longer can they last? Not even Santa could help them out of this mess. Number one, Donnie. With the death of a relative or lover comes the familiar feeling that you've lost a limb. One tribe in the Papua province, Indonesia, paid tribute to this idea in a literal and violent way by chopping off the tops of women's fingers. They don't do this anymore, according to reports, but it was once common in the Dani tribe for people to offer up their digits at funerals. Based in Wamena, a remote town in the Cyclops Mountains, the tribe also puts ashes and clay on their faces as part of the business of mourning. But it's the amputation that naturally grabbed the most attention. The finger would be made numb by having a string tied tightly around it. This apparently makes the experience a bit more comfortable. Mind you, comfort probably wasn't the idea. You certainly would not relax once the wound was cauterized. Ouch. Still, the suffering of grief surely weighs much heavier for the Donnie. Maybe you can see the point of all this, but it's probably for the best that they stop doing it. Would you have the dedication to give up a fingertip for a loved one? Thanks for watching. Are there any other bizarre practices or scary tribes you think should be included on a list like this? Let me know in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye.